This is that random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities. So I want you to see how this works. Here we have 25 possible outcomes. Each one has a letter of the alphabet. So letters A to Z, 25 different possible outcomes. Now, I have them stacked up to show the probability. So probability is, is in the upper direction. You see over here the little, the little thing that looks like the graph axis. So probability is up this way and possibilities go from A to Z this way. All right, so this thing that the red arrows here is the probability distribution of the possibilities. Possibilities, A, B, C, D, so on to Z. And here's the probability distribution. The higher they are up, the more probable they are. Okay, so getting a B here, look at the first two, getting a B is twice as probable as getting an A, because there's two Bs and one A. Now, the random draw from this probability distribution works like this. We take that one A and we throw it over here in this box. It's a little hole in the box. We throw that A in there. We take two Bs and we're gonna throw two Bs into that box. Think of it as little uh, maybe note cards with an A on it or two note cards, each, each note card having a B on it. Okay, and then we're gonna put two C's in it and then we put one D in it. We're not gonna put any E's in it. We're gonna put one F in it, and three G's and six H's and 12 I's and 17 J's and 25 K's and so on. And if we do that, we sum all of that up and we get 163. So there's 163 pieces of paper in this box. Only one of those pieces of paper has an A on it and one more has a Z on it and there's, what, five of them that have T's on them, and so on, out of the 163. Okay, a random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities takes that box, stirs it up, randomizes it, shakes it, rolls it around, reaches in randomly, and pulls one out. And that is what the rendering engine delivers as what happens next. Okay, so you see it, it'd be much more likely in this case, if this was the actual distribution and you reached into this box, you're likely to get a I, J, K, L, or M, maybe an S, maybe an R. That's what you're likely to get. You're unlikely to get an A or a Z, you see? So the things that are more probable, you're more likely to get out of this random draw. You're more likely to get the things out that are more probable. Okay, so that's what I mean by a random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities. Okay. Now, what that means is that all kinds of strange things can happen. And we know life is like that. <laughs> you know, life is like that. Strange things can happen. So it could be that those 163 cards in there with different letters written on them, it could that we pull out an A or a Z. It's possible. We're never going to get an E because there aren't any E's in there. So we'll not get one of those. There's zero of those. But we are, you know, one out of 163 is our probability of getting an A and the same probability of getting a Z. Okay. So it could be that when we make this draw, we'll end up with an A or a Z. And that'll be just, wow, nobody expected that. That's just one of those, you know, you make a measurement, you come out with a, with a strange result, and that's the way your reality is rendered. Sometimes things are strange. Okay, so that's what it means. Now, when this random draw is made, that is the collapse of the probability function to a physical result. That's what's happening when you, when you, get a physical result at a measurement. So we have a double slit experiment. And I'm gonna measure on the screen. Where is that gonna hit on the screen? Well, there's all these different places it could land. And, and I'll show you that when we talk about the double slit experiment later. It goes into that distribution, makes a random draw, gets something, and that's where it places that dot on the screen. 
Okay. That's where it places that dot on the screen. That's where the measurement is. The screen makes the measurement when the dot hits it, because when the dot hits it, it leaves a little trace of where it hit. So that's where the measurement is made. This is a little cartoon of what I've just told you, kind of how it works, all put together in a simple little diagram. We got the player and the computer. And you see it where it says computer rendering engine here. And underneath of that, it's the computer works with a mostly deterministic rule set with some randomness. And out the top, we get a simplified uh, probability and statistics model of the reality. Well, out of that probability model goes the output that goes to the player. It says, player, this is what your reality looks like. This is how it works. Go play. The player makes choices about what his avatar is doing, and that's the input to the computer engine. And so the computer looks and says, well, how does what that player did with his avatar, how does that action interact with all the other actions up here in this top part? And what do we need to do to generate the data and the player? Besides that, there's this future probability database we talked about that is required for this. You know, it's required for this. This data is all the probabilities of all the possibilities. So the system needs that. It needs a database of all the possibilities and the probabilities of those possibilities. That's this future probable database here. And that's an input to this rendering engine. All right. And the last little cartoon I wanna show you is we talk about the probable future database. Well, this is another little cartoon just to help you visualize it because I know it's easier to get things if you can see pictures than it is to deal with the abstractions that are described in the words. So this is uh, a cartoon of a probable, of a future probable reality surface. Now, the thing that's our, our virtual reality is run on is not a surface. I'm just making this up so I can make a picture for you to show you. So notice that we have this disc, that's the surface and we have T here and a line T here. T is time and is radial. So time is starts at the center at zero and goes out. So zero at the center is the present moment. That's now. Now is at the center. So time goes from the center out. So this is future, future probable. So as you see, as time goes out, the number of tall peaks is really not very many. I mean, we look out in this area, and here's something that has about the same probability, not very sensitive to time, doesn't change much. And here's something that has, you know, a little more probability right at this place, and then time goes out a little further and it's gone. So it's just one of those things that might just happen just then. Uh, notice that in here around now, there's lots of tall peaks because when you're just a little bit away from the present moment, it's not that hard. A lot of things are probable. <laughs> a whole lot of things are very probable at that point because it's only a very little time for them to change. Mostly you don't get high peaks that are out very far in time, but you know, here's a couple and there's one over here. Well, these would be good things if you were a prognosticator, if you were going to uh, bet on the future, you know, you're going to invest your money wisely. You'd say, well, I see, you know, in the future, it's going to be plastics, you know, or something like that, then that would be plastics out here on a, a far way out. Maybe you're still 10 or 20 years from plastics, but you see it and it's got a high probability, even though it's that far out. So some things that would be a good, a good thing to invest in because the probability is high. But now these probabilities change all the time. Every time choices are made, things happen, free will is 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 uh, applied and a lot of these probabilities depend on what's happening now the future is born out of the you know of the past so what changes now will change the future so that's just a little click so anyway i just wanted to put that up to give you a visual so you'd get some sense of what this this uh, virtual probability database is like and note here, the calculated probability of all reasonable choices based on this, everything reasonable that could happen and the probability that it will. That means there's a limit. 
I don't know just what that limit is, but let's say it's, uh, you know, anything that's less probable than 10 to the minus 20 is ignored. Or 10 to the minus 50, who knows? But there's a, there's a limit beyond which you limit. You don't look at everything that's possible because that's too much. You only want to look at the things that look like they're going to go in play. Okay, so it's only reasonable choices. Reasonably could happen. So we're not going to worry about 10 to the minus 50 probability and put it on our chart. We just throw that out. It's, it's too unlikely to even deal with. So the system has its own AI inside to define what's reasonable based on all the data that it's processed in the past and things that have happened afterwards. Now, see, that makes this workable. If you have to do everything, no matter how unreasonable it is, that creates a huge model, which isn't workable, which is the very problem that the many worlds people run into. Because they can't say that there is an intelligence or an AI out there that limits the amount of the, the significance of a change before another reality is created because they can't do that in a materialistic world, they have to do everything. So if an electron goes from spin up to spin down, oh, a whole new universe has to be created for that event because there's nobody that's gonna say, that electron's in the middle of the ocean, it doesn't really make any difference. It doesn't affect anything because that would take a consciousness, that would take a mind, that would take a choice. A materialist can't go there. There is no mind, there is no consciousness, there is nothing to make that distinction between what's important and what's not. Therefore, many worlds has to create a new universe for every change, no matter how small and inconsequential, it gets a whole new universe. Well, as you can imagine, that gets out of hand very quickly. That isn't computable. It's too much. It's not good computer science when you can accomplish everything as I've described it. And it's just not that big a calculation comparatively to, you know, the many worlds or the bottoms up. All those worlds are also bottoms up. Every, all of those, you know, Quintillion, quintillion, quintillion worlds are all computed from the bottoms up and they're sprouting off new worlds faster than they can, they can be assessed. All right, so just wanna make that point. The last bullet, okay. This database, past and probable future, enables the accurate and reliable gathering of intuitive information of all sorts, remote viewing, Auras, health, communication, empathy, general interactions with the past or probable future, all these things become possible because of this database. This is a database that anybody who explores consciousness will run into this information because it's there. It's part of our virtual reality. And when the, when the early... Uh, Hindus ran into it, they gave it a name, they called it the Akashic Records. Well, Akashic Records are just a database that has to be put together in order for the rendering engine to do its job more efficiently. 